Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and uh, of course this is uh, Shackleton the Explorer, and uh, I don't know, he, he's a bit camera shy these days, but anyway, he's keeping my neck warm at the moment as I discuss uh, some more details of the uh, state of the climate in 2020. The BAMS report, Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, has loads and loads of uh, details on the climate system. And um, I'm going through a lot of the figures um, in, in great detail in my videos here, both to explain it to you, but also to make sure that I can figure it out myself. Now, I've been having a few problems with the sound quality lately, so I got a, a Yeti microphone, which I'm gonna, which I'm testing out right now. So hopefully the sound quality is is better um, from now now as we move forward. Okay, so um, this is a report, state of the climate in 2020. It's by the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, or BAMS. It was just published online uh, less than a month ago, and it's chock full of details on the climate. This was a blog posting that was just done, uh, Climate Turmoil Details on How Trends Across the Earth Are Undergoing Rapid Change. So I'm doing, I'm covering lots of information and uh, in, lo in longer videos because there's just so many details and some of this stuff I will be using uh, when I go to the COP26 to, to give daily uh, press briefings and presentations on how serious the uh, climate system is, is uh, you know, is, is becoming, you know, how, how dire the situation is becoming. Okay, so this image here, this shows the couple of the um, configurations of the atmosphere in terms of mean sea level pressure, the anomalies. So brown is lower than, um, brown is lower, blue is higher, okay? And you can see, you know, the different configurations. So this was the 2020 configuration, the 2019 configuration, and 2018 configuration. Uh, configuration over the winter of 2018, 2019, and so on. This is the North Atlantic um, Oscillation Index. Okay, so when it's positive, the polar vortex is essentially tighter. When it's negative, it's looser, and when it's looser, you get more cold air spilling south. So you can see the fluctuations um, throughout the year. Um, this was in the last year here. In, in 2020. And then we have the same thing for the Antarctic. So here's the Antarctic with the configurations and the mean sea level pressure anomalies. And you can see this, the basically we're in the red most of the time in 2020. So the stratospheric polar vortex is quite strong. The winds are circulating Antarctica quite strongly. So the temperatures, the cold is confined into toward more to the continent and less is spilling out um, northward. This is the uh, wind speed um, across the surface of the earth and basically the average wind speeds uh, the, the time is 1970 to 2020 here you can see a general trend downward until about 2012 and then the wind speeds you know, in the globe and over each of the continents tends, tended to increase from there. Um, interesting change of direction. Um, and, uh, you know, this is sort of overall trends. Um, so you can compare 2020 to the previous, the trend of, since 1988. And you can see some areas where the overall trend is to weaker winds and other areas are to stronger winds. Um, some more wind plots um, and this is I want to go now to this is stratospheric uh, zonal winds and basically 
So it's from 2000 to 2020. It's from um, from 100 hexapascal. So it's up in the stratosphere, lower stratosphere to the upper stratosphere. You can see that the winds change direction because the orange colors are the winds going in the easterly direction and the purple shades are in the westerly direction. So um, what you can see is a change every few years um, in direction of these uh, the mean stratospheric zonal winds. The Earth radiation budget, we switched from a um, weak El Nino to a very weak uh, La Nina and the cloud cover was affected mostly at the um, near the equator and that caused differences in the outgoing long wave radiation and in the reflected short wave radiation um, these patterns here are because of the switch from the from one to the other um, this is the uh, transparency of the atmosphere at Mauna Loa Hawaii and you can see dips um, as a volcano goes off and puts up a lot of aerosols into the upper atmosphere, that can block some sunlight and cause a dip in the transmission of light through the atmosphere. So this was the Agung volcano. Didn't put a lot up into the stratosphere, so not much effect. El Chichen in Mexico in the early 80s put a lot of aerosols in the atmosphere, dropped the transmission, and that you can see the recovery here over several years. And then Pinatubo here, quick drop in the transmission through the atmosphere of light, and then a recovery here over several years. Okay, so that's clearly, um, that's quite interesting and can be seen clearly. Now, in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, this is the, uh, this is the 1979 to 2020, the rise in nitrous oxide, the rise in methane, and the rise in CO2. And the red curve is the actual annual change in parts per million per year in the take case of CO2, parts per billion per year for both methane and nitrous oxide. Um, so a couple of things can be seen. You know, CO2 is steadily trending upward. Um, we have had years that are three parts per billion rise per year, right? There's a couple. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's more like 2.5 uh, now, is uh, the tr unless it spikes upward. Methane, um, we're getting, we have a very large rise, up to 15 parts per billion per year now. We're getting more methane from fracking, more from wetlands. Um, there's more coming out from the Arctic and things like that. So I would expect that we're going to see large rises in methane. There's some stuff going on right now that people have been commenting on on social media, and I'll do a whole video on methane soon. Nitrous oxide has been trending upward, the amount of in parts per billion per year going into the atmosphere. And of course, this is a very strong greenhouse gas, and it's got a strong light, uh, long lifetime. In fact, these are the uh, this is a summary of the long-lived greenhouse gases for 2020. So you've got CO2, methane, nitrous oxide. The radiative forcing, um, 2.11 watts per meter squared for CO2. Methane is about a quarter of that, 0 0.52 watts per square meter. Nitrous oxide is about 10% of the CO2 amount, 0.21. If you add those up, you get 2. Uh, 2.84 watts per square meter. So that's the radiate the total radiative forcing. Um, that's the imbalance of energy that is heating up the planet. And this has a lifetime of methane of 9.1 years of, and nitrous oxide 123 years. CO2, it doesn't give it, um, but CO2 can last in the, in the atmosphere for, you know, for centuries to uh, millennia. Okay, it really depends on the sinks. It's a stable gas, so it just it look, you need to look at these at the source and sinks and and look at the balance or budget of CO two, and of course it's all it's increasing each year. Um, and then we have the CFCs, the, the chlorofluorocarbons, and they're not they don't have an insignificant radiative forcing. I mean, you can see the numbers; they're a lot lower than the the main the big three, but they're still there. And then next we have um, 
the hydrochlor the HCFCs, the HFCs, chlorocarbons, bromocarbons, and then other fully fluorinated species. F sulfur hexafluoride, SF6, is a very stable molecule. It's got a very large lifetime and it can, you know, have a significant radiative forcing. It's used in a lot of industrial processes. We gotta we've got to be very careful about how much of that we put up into the into the atmosphere. This is the um, radiative forcing that I just described above, but in a in a graph here. So 1979 to 2020. Um, so if we look at the radiative forcing of the of all the gases, um, we're here. We're over three here. Okay. If you take just the big three, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. That's the first three colors here. Okay, so take off about 0.19 from here, 3.1, you know, we're the, we're the number I told you, just under three. But when you add up all of the others here, um, you know, and they appear in, in terms of abundance here. So if you add up the first, the, the, these ones all make a difference on, on this plot, the first, say, six or so, right? Maybe six colors here. And uh, that's over three watts per square meter of forcing average globally. If, and there's something called the, um, the annual greenhouse gas index. And this is defined to have a value of one in 1990. So this index here on this scale has a value of one in 1990. And it's, it's uh, 1.47 in 2020. 47% more forcing all of the greenhouse gases than we had in 1990. This is the annual increase. There is fluctuation, but it's pretty, it's pretty steady. Okay. Um, and if you look at the, um, the halogenated gases, this is in parts per thousand. They can, they all have different effects over time. Some are stabilized because they're controlled substances in refrigerants and stuff. Other ones are decreasing, some are increasing, and this scale only goes up to 100. This is from this up to 500. So if we're looking in this domain here and expand it, we can see these type of, of uh, gases. So we have to keep a handle on those, and there is a variation of these, of course, depending on the sources, the industrial sources, but with latitude, there's a, there, with year, there's a variation here. Um, and uh, you know they eventually mix in the atmosphere if they're long lived, and you can see this is uh, in the Antarctic region, um, which is you know where we have to really keep an eye on these chlorinated uh, materials in order to see you know in order to try to get ozone hole recovery. So in 2000 it was the highest in Antarctica, the sum of all these, and it's been decreased uh, because of the um, Montreal uh, Protocol. These are, um, this is the aerosol optical depth, if you like. Um, so the regions that are the brownest are where you have the highest dust sources. So there's dust here and here, and it's, it's carried out over the, over the uh, ocean. And there's generate, dust being generated from industry in China and India here, you can see. And you can see the fluctuation over the years. Um, the monthly is the red, so like large fluctuations month to month, year to year, within a year, and then the annual is the smoothed out value. Again, this is the mean aerosol optical depth, um, 2003 to 2020, and then the trend. Okay, so it so parts of the world are having less aerosols, but there's some you know India is still producing quite a bit, and this is the trend in the most recent decade. Um, Okay, and there's some more, uh, more uh, we've seen this plot before, and the effect on the cloud inter aerosol cloud interactions and aerosol radiation interactions. So the aerosol has an impact in clouds because the aerosols act as cloud condensation nuclei. They also have direct effects on the radiation. This is the uh, ozone values, the total ozone values um, in the northern hemisphere are the upper colored plots, this blue one here and this purple one. And you can see the ozone hole, a bit of an ozone hole that was created in the northern hemisphere, 
towards the end of the northern hemisphere winter and you can see the, oh, the the months are offset for the southern hemisphere to below and you can see the hole here and the hole here so the the, the ozone hole is still a problem um, especially in, in Antarctica these are um, these are total column ozone numbers around around the planet um, again by year and you can see that the total column numbers have decreased and somewhat stabilized but there's a lot of year-to-year -year fluctuation more more stuff on ozone um, these are st lower stratospheric water vapor anomalies um, at different locations over time so there's fluctuation but there's no huge trend you know up or down okay and this in the water that's in the water that gets up into the lower stratosphere and some water can be put there by um, enormous um, cumulonimbus clouds that punch through the tropopause other water vapor can get there by methane breaking down by hydroxide um, into uh, water and co2 um, Okay, so that can also be a source for water vapor. When there's lots of methane and water vapor in the stratosphere, you can get these uh, stratospheric clouds. Um, this is the... Um, okay, so this is, this is showing uh, more, more water vapor stuff. Okay, uh, tropospheric ozone. This is the ozone that is in the lower atmosphere and contributes greatly to uh, air pollution and to people having trouble breathing you know especially if you've you've got respiratory problems etc ground level ozone can be a huge problem it's, it's a bigger problem in cities than it is out in rural areas because it's being generated um, by industrial you know within cities in industrial processes incomplete combustion um, reactions, uh, you know, in cars and uh, any electrical sparking generates ozone. As you know, you can you can get that, uh, you know, that blue arc in that's the ozone that you're seeing coming off when there's sparks. Carbon monoxide, global carbon monoxide, it trended down here till about 2010, and then it's been somewhat uh, more or less stable. Of course, you get CO2, CO rather, from incomplete combustion. There is a seasonal cycle of monthly global carbon monoxide. Over, this is over Europe, and this is over North America. Okay, so you get peaks here in May and, and uh, drops uh, minimum in summer months in both Europe and North America. Um, land surface properties, uh, this is the albedo in the visible and near infrared for different regions the globe smooth is the black curve uh, southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere so there are some changes um, they're all within you know they're, they're all much less than plus or minus uh, five percent here okay um, and I, I'll skip some of that biomass burning Okay, this is biomass global f map of fire activity in 2020 in terms of carbon consumption. Grams of carbon per square meter per year. And you can see the regions where there's, um, there's uh, a lot of carbon being burned and there's carbon um, released. This is, uh, this is the, how, the uptick over the years from 2000 and uh, three or so to 2020 and you can see this is South America okay Western US big uptick in fires Australia parts of Australia big uptick and the Arctic is especially worrying the uptick in fires especially if that smoke gets up over, over the North Pole gets onto the the white ice and snow in the Arctic decreasing the albedo increasing the melt um, this is to do with the timing of vegetation, you know, when the season begins, when the season ends in terms of vegetation growth, and the phenology is all about the timing of it, okay, and how that is changing over time. Uh, okay, I'll just keep going a bit here. 
Okay, um, you can look at the vegetation on the surface of the planet at different wavelengths, um, and that's what they're doing here, different bands of, of detected by satellite, and you can see, you can monitor where the vegetation is on the planet, and then you can overlay that with drought areas and excessive rain areas and try to get a, a feeling for um, you know how the vegetation is being um, is is changed by the uh, you know the droughts and the different extreme weather events that we're seeing. Okay, so that's um, I'll I'll finish up here, and uh, I think the next section is um, well. There's a few more things here. I mean, there's some supplementary material. So we've got this. We've got different models of air temperature. This is a Japanese one. So this is a, this is 2020 relative to the 1981 to 2010 baseline, the anomalies, and and uh, this is the European data data, and this this is a NASA one, the US one, and then there's uh, another one, Hadley Cruz, uh, here. Okay, so you can compare all those and you can look at the hydro hydrological cycle, the specific humidity, the, uh, you know, from, from the different models, total column, water vapor, um, and so on. Okay, there's a lot of supplementary materials as well. Um, I won't go into all of those. I mean, there's all kinds of breakdowns of the precipitation extremes in each month throughout the year. For example, soil, mo soil moisture in each month of the year in areas where it's decreasing and increasing, the anomalies. Okay, there's all kinds of uh, data here, but I'm going to stop here. Um, the next section is uh, global oceans, and I'll talk about that. But there's a video, there's a very interesting um, phenomena which is not related to climate change, which I'm going to... Uh, do a, do a, another video on tonight. I think it's uh, very interesting and I, I think you'll enjoy it. So stay tuned for that. Anyway, thank you for listening and I hope my uh, Yeti uh, microphone is working well and uh, improves these videos. Uh, so let me know about that. Okay, thanks for listening and please consider, uh, you know, check out my website, paulbeckwith.net if you haven't and please consider donating to my research and analysis and videos as I try to teach you all about, uh, you know, abrupt climate system change, you know, both in the past, present day, and then, uh, you know, try to anticipate trends and uh, make some sort of predictions for what we can expect in the near term uh, climate on this planet. Again, thank you very much for listening. Bye for now.